What is it that made Star Trek good? To answer that question, we must first establish some parameters. By Star Trek, I am referring to all the series and movies which were made under the original Star Trek license. Since everything that was made after Enterprise is under a different license, what I am going to say here will not apply to those products. By calling Star Trek good, I mean to say that the positives significantly outweigh the negatives, and that the model and premises behind the series are strong. To make an analogy, Star Trek is like paella, mostly satisfying and pleasant, but with a few bits that must be spit out. More on this analogy later. I recognize that when it comes to matters of entertainment, there will always be some subjectivity involved in determining whether or not a thing is good. A tool such as a hammer can be considered objectively good or bad because it has one specific function, and it's easy to judge whether or not it fulfills that function. The merits of entertainment are more difficult to judge because what's pleasant to one man may be revolting to another. So in other words, most of this is a matter of opinion. In my view, there are three basic elements that make Star Trek good. The lore, character development, and exploration slash problem solving. Take away any of those elements and you will have something which would not be recognizable as Star Trek. Lore. The lore is the history and rules of a universe. Lore is important because it provides setting and consistency to any stories that you wish to tell. In this regard, Star Trek TOS had the hardest job, since it had to introduce the lore as it went along. But once it was finished, it became the lore for all the later series. Rules govern the operation of the fictitious universe, just like rules govern our real universe. It's good to have them because without them it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to suspend disbelief. A thing may be unrealistic, but as long as it's consistent, people will be able to follow along. In a good series, rules are not established through long exposition, but they are observed through story-relevant manifestations. Some of the rules established by Star Trek TOS are as follows. 1. If the ship goes around a star at a certain speed and distance, then it will be catapulted through time. 2. The galaxy is enclosed by a destructive energy barrier. 3. A person can be converted to energy, transmitted elsewhere, and reassembled without dying. Now, these things are not actually possible in real life, but they can be accepted as real and or valid within the fictitious universe because they are consistent in that context. If you take away the consistent rules, you get something like Space 1999, where anything can happen, and it's impossible for the viewer to understand how that universe works. I actually did like Space 1999, but I don't consider it to be high quality by any metric. History is everything that happened in the universe prior to the events of the current story, as well as culture, values, and politics that are connected with it. In real life, culture influences the unfolding of history, but history also shapes and informs culture. Star Trek took that model when building their alien cultures, and the recurring civilizations, and most of the others, have their own politics, values, and culture. They also typically have their own technology, architecture, and costume style. I would say that establishing the values, beliefs, and culture of an alien civilization is more important than a unique physical appearance or anatomy. A unique physical appearance without a cultural backdrop is just window dressing, and alien anatomy is only relevant if it affects behavior. For example, I was never very interested in the alien species of Star Wars because most of them did not represent any particular culture. They were just there. The only significant cultural divide in Star Wars I was able to discern was the Empire versus the Rebels. Most of the aliens in Star Wars could be taken out without significantly affecting the story. When it comes to Star Trek, it's not hard for a fan to imagine how the primary alien cultures would react to a new situation or to one another in a new setting. A new story can be written or imagined just by predicting how the existing cultures would react to a new stimuli. That is a testament to the strength of the lore. 
Over the course of TOS, it was established how the Romulans, Klingons, and Federation, Vulcans included, worked, and what exactly they were. This paved the way for all the later series, which were able to build on this and add to the lore. The cultures are established through a mix of exposition and demonstration, showing how they react to situations. For example, in the Star Trek TOS episode, Errand of Mercy, Kirk states to the Organians that Klingons have a brutal military dictatorship, and that they should prefer to side with the Federation over the Klingons because the latter would destroy their way of life. When the Klingons finally do arrive, their behavior is on display, and Kirk is shown to have been correct. In fact, the values and methodology of the Klingons are presented as problems for Kirk and Spock to overcome, even as they are being introduced. Character Development Just as it is with the main cultures of Star Trek, the main characters all have their own unique personalities and behaviors. Though there is some exposition, like when a character's history is discussed in episode, the personalities of the characters are primarily established by showing how they react to the situations they encounter. In other words, it's done as part of the story rather than a break from it or an aside. The audience doesn't have to be told by the character why they are good or great at what they do, because it's evident by watching them. Most Star Trek fans will have one or more captain which they prefer over the others. Usually their preference is based on how that particular captain reacts to different situations, and when arguments ensue between fans over which captain is better, it comes down to which has the best way of doing things. For me, my favorite captains are Kirk, Picard, and Sisko. The other captains were alright, but not as good in my view. I did like most of the main characters in all the Star Trek series. In the few cases where I didn't like a character, it was not due to lack of development, but rather because I just didn't like the personality of that character. Exploration and Problem Solving Every good sci-fi series should have adventure and problem solving. If the main focus is drama, then the futuristic or alien elements just become window dressing. Almost every episode in every Star Trek series follows the same basic model. A problem and or mystery is introduced, the crew works to solve it, and finally there is a resolution or reveal. The lure to keep people watching is to see not only how the problem is solved, but also how the crew reacts to it and how it affects them. Over the course of the episode, the audience will usually get to see some alien planet, realm, or culture, which is important because most of us will never actually be able to go into space and see anything there for ourselves. We are, for all intents and purposes, grounded. There is mystery, action, resolution, and interesting scenery and settings. Now, the reason I said almost every episode follows this format is because there are some story arcs that take more than one episode to conclude. DS9 and Enterprise, in particular, got into some long, overarching narratives, but for the most part, something would be resolved or revealed before the end of each episode. Just to be clear, I group exploration and problem-solving together because the two are inextricably linked, and the exploration is often the problem or the mystery that's being solved. So I don't want anyone to be confused and say, how come you're saying there's three items when in fact there's four? But it, I say there's three because the exploration and problem solving cannot really be separated from one another. They're inextricable. Other strengths. You may think of those three items, lore, character development, and exploration slash problem solving as the tripod of Star Trek, or the tripod of Trek. Take away one leg from a tripod and it will fall over. But there are other items of strength which bear mentioning. One thing that I thought was very good about every Star Trek series was the use of light and color. The ship for each series was always well lit, both on the bridge and in the corridors, which made it easy to see all of the characters and whatever happened to be going on there. DS9 was a little darker, but the illumination was still sufficient. 
Another strong aspect of Star Trek was that every series was generally positive and upbeat. There is no shortage of things in the real world to be depressed about, so to me, positive escapism is the best kind. Weaknesses Coming to the weaknesses of Star Trek, there are a few that bear mentioning. One problem which ran through every series is how most of the different species can reproduce with one another. The idea that humans, Klingons, and Vulcans would all be interfertile in spite of having different organs and blood chemistry strains credibility. Going forward, I think this issue is best left alone since it is already established as a rule, and changing established rules causes more problems than it solves. I would leave it in place, but spend little time discussing it narratively. But coming to a more serious issue, there are canon contradictions between some of the different series which were never reconciled, and each contradiction left standing is damaging to suspended disbelief. For example, there is an episode of Voyager called Threshold, where they tried to establish Warp 10 as some kind of barrier that, when breached, causes people to mutate into amphibians. However, in both TOS and TNG, the Enterprise went faster than Warp 10 without causing any issues. I can only conclude that the writer of that episode had either not watched all of the previous series or simply disregarded them. Both possibilities are unacceptable, and if more Star Trek is ever made, then better care should be taken to stay in line with canon. When crafting a fictitious universe, consistency is important because that is the only way that unrealistic premises can be given any veneer of reality. Most of the other weaknesses I have seen are, for me, matters of opinion and were not enough to make me stop watching as they were outweighed by the good. Therefore, I will leave the matter and get back to my analogy. Anyone who has spent time in Spain should know what paella is, but for those who have not, I'll briefly explain. Paella is rice with the most popular meat groups mixed in. It can have beef, chicken, squid, mussels, or oysters, pork, and shrimp. Sometimes all, but usually at least three or four. Usually, there are at least some shells, typically from mussels, and sometimes from shrimp. But sometimes there are none. The paellas that I liked the best were those that I could just voraciously devour without having to inspect or take time to pick things out of. To me, the ideal paella has no shells, but having a few large shells which are easy to pick out or eat around is also fine. A good paella is one where nothing comes between me and my ability to enjoy the taste and to fill my stomach. While I was in Spain, I had one paella where they didn't bother to remove any of the exoskeleton from the shrimp. As a result, it was strewn with severed legs, antenna, eyes, and shells. There was something inedible in every spoonful, no matter what part of the dish it was drawn from. Chitin is completely unsuitable for eating, being difficult to both chew and swallow, and it has no nutritional value either. Ultimately, it was not worth the effort to eat that particular paella, and it was easier to just hold out and wait for something better to eat. Star Trek is like the type of paella that just has a few large shells, although some series have more shells than others. Most of the 21st century entertainment that I'm seeing as of now, whether it is comics, shows, or movies, is more like the unpleasant and inedible chitin-filled paella that I refused to eat. This analogy isn't perfect, however, because everyone must either eat or die, and not everyone can afford to eat what they want. But no one has to consume entertainment to survive. I can pass indefinitely on bad entertainment until something suitable for consumption comes along. People die from lack of food and water, but not from lack of entertainment.